Welcome, everyone, to this event, Governing Finance for People and Planet. It's the fourth instalment of IIPP's 2023 festival, the Entrepreneurial State 2.0, Rethinking the State in the 21st Century. My name is Josh Ryan Collins, and I'm Associate Professor in Economics and Finance here at IIPP. I've been researching the financial system and talking to financial policymakers for about 15 years. Um, both here and at my previous position at the New Economics Foundation, a, a UK-based think tank. And I got interested in, in the financial sector 15 years ago because it was 15 years ago that we had the greatest financial crisis uh, since the 1930s, the global financial crisis. Um, and it's worth just remembering that, I think, that, that this was 15 years ago now. Uh, and part of what I'd like to do today, really, with, with the panellists, is kind of review, uh, you know, have we made progress since that, that disaster uh, 15 years ago? Because we've had a lot happen since then. We've had major reforms to financial regulation. We've seen extraordinary interventions by central banks, uh, including the creation of trillions of pounds of, of new money in the form of quantitative easing or QE programmes. We've seen record low or indeed negative real interest rates for an extraordinary long period. And we've seen an explosion of new initiatives in the area of sustainable finance, ranging from increasingly sophisticated green bond schemes to various forms of environmental and social governance asset classes to green taxonomies uh, issued most recently by the European Union to try and encourage more green financial flows. And I think it's fair to say there has been progress, um, if you think of where we were back, back in 2008. So, you know, commercial banks do appear to be better capitalised than they were, they were before the crisis. Major central banks in the global north have acted decisively to support governments as they, um, as they uh, engaged in a massive fiscal stimulus um, to support economies in danger of collapsing during the COVID-19 crisis. So we saw some coordination there between fiscal and monetary policy. And they've also, central banks have also accepted, I think, that climate change poses a serious threat to both price and financial stability. And they've introduced a, a range of, of regimes, climate risk disclosure regimes, scenario analysis, climate stress testing, uh, to try and make sure the financial system is better equipped uh, to support the, the net zero transition. And there has been significant growth in the financing of green uh, investment and ESG initiatives uh, and a range of international and multilateral financial alliances and collaborations focused on stimulating more private sector investment, in particular into green infrastructure in developing and emerging markets where it's most needed. So that's the, the, the good side of things. On the other hand, um, the record low interest rates and the quantitative easing programs of the last few decades have seen an explosion of lending and investment into non-traditional asset classes, including property and, and shares, stocks and shares. And this has led a lot of people think to you know, asset bubbles and also widening wealth inequality because most of that money has ended up supporting people who already had those assets and contributing to the, to the global housing crisis. So um, there has been some side effects from these liquidity programs. Um, and the low interest rate, rate regime, of course, has suddenly been reversed uh, more recently as, as inflation has kicked in after the uh, Ukraine war and the COVID recovery. Partially because, and they've had to do it very rapidly, central banks have rapidly introduced rates because they failed to foresee this inflation. And this has contributed to the, really the worst bout of financial instability we've seen since the financial crisis, with the collapse of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and then Credit Suisse and further problems with many mid-sized banks in the US. And this has led to some sort of serious questioning, I guess, of the post-financial crisis regulatory consensus and regulatory settlement. And volatile interest rates on, on supposedly safe assets like, like government bonds have also sent tremors through other parts of the financial system, such as pension funds we saw in the UK, um, that pension funds almost fell over and required a massive bailout by the Bank of England 
um, to step in. Um, meanwhile, in the, in the global south, we've seen um, many economies in a state of, of crisis. Uh, they've been unable to uh, meet international debt repayments that have exploded due to the COVID crisis and the rise in interest rates, which has contributed to deteriorating exchange rates um, that follow the, the, the inflation spike. So whilst global north central banks you know, did act uh, successfully, it's not clear that the, the global north's done enough to support the, the global south from a financial perspective. Then finally, in regard to climate change, we've, we, whilst we've seen some progress in more money going to green, the real problem has been lack of progress in the reduction of financial flows going into gas, oil, and even coal-intensive projects and industrial activity. Uh, we've seen the collapse uh, of the Glasgow Financial Alliance on net zero, the GFANS uh, program, which was, was hailed by many as a sort of turning point, really, in terms of getting big financial actors to, to rethink their play, uh, approach to investment. And in the US in particular, we've seen a strong reaction against green finance, ESG regimes being described as, as woke initiatives um, by various parts of the Republican Party. Um, and this has had a, a material impact actually on, on some of the big asset managers, um, such as BlackRock, for example. Um, and more generally, I suppose, whilst we've seen this explosion in size of capital markets, um, we've, we've not seen strong evidence that they're able to provide the kind of patient long-term capital that might be uh, required for the, the green transition. And this is concerns around, around ongoing short-termism there. So um, I think what we need to do is to try and work through these dynamics and then think about what the, what the solutions are, you know, what's going on and what policy initiatives do we need? How do we govern finance in the interest of people and planet? And I'm delighted to be joined by a really a fantastic panel to help us answer these questions. Uh, on my left, I have Anne Pettifor, who's a political economist, author and campaigner and currently director of the Policy Research in Macroeconomics think tank, which promotes Keynes' monetary theory and policies. Uh, Anne's list of achievements is a long one, and I'm not going to uh, try and cover all of it right now. But she's probably best known, and I certainly know her best, I think, from uh, her, her book, The Coming First World Debt Crisis, which correctly uh, predicted the coming great financial crisis, uh, unlike most uh, economists. She was one of the few that did predict it. And I do remember reading that book on a beach somewhere hot uh, in 2006 and thinking, hang on, I need, I need to get into this, this topic. And that really did have an impact on, on my future career in that, in that sense. So thanks for that, Anne. Um, she's also very well known for her work on the Green New Deal, um, which she first developed along with a number of British economists when she was at uh, the New Economics Foundation. And that's the topic of her most recent book, The Case for a Green New Deal. She's also written a book called The Production of Money and also The Economic Consequences of Mr. Os uh, Mr. Osborne, powerful critique of austerity. However, she's not just a writer, she's also known for her campaigning work, including uh, on sovereign debt. She led the Jubilee 2000 campaign, which is part of an international movement, resulted ultimately in the cancellation of approximately 100 billion of debt owed by the poorest countries. On the Screen behind us, we have Brett Christophers. Hi, Brett. Hopefully you can all hear him. Um, he's professor in the Institute of Housing and Urban Research in the Department of Human Geography at Uppsala University in Sweden. Um, he is a political economist and economic geographer and is the author of uh, over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles uh, and is the editor of the leading political economy journal, Environment and Planning A. Um, but he's also probably best known as the author of some really fantastic books, including Banking Across Boundaries, Placing Finance in Capitalism, The New Enclosure, The Appropriation of Public Land in Neoliberal Britain, and Rentier uh, Capitalism. Um, and his most recent book is Our Lives in Their Portfolios, Why Asset Managers Own the World. Um, and we will definitely be uh, interrogating him on, on that, which is... Uh, which is coming up. So um, I, I, I'm re reluctant to admit that nearly all of these books are, are ones I wish I'd written. Um, so I have to <laughs> have to thank Brett for getting there first and doing such a great job uh, in, in describing really tough uh, 
tough uh, topics in a very engaging and accessible way. So delighted to have him here. Finally, we have Ingrid Holmes, who is the executive director of the Green Finance Institute, whose mission is to accelerate the transition to a clean, resilient, and environmentally sustainable economy by channeling capital at pace and scale towards real economy outcomes that will create jobs and increase prosperity for all. So I think we can all agree on that. Um, she was previously a director and head of policy and advocacy at Federated Hermes International, a major global asset manager focused on responsible investment and has over 15 years of experience working on environmental policy and sustainable finance issues, including being director at climate change think tank E3G and positions at the low carbon asset manager climate change capital. She's also been an energy and environment advisor for the UK Parliament and an advisor to the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, previously, she had a completely different career in science publishing and journalism. So extraordinarily well equipped for today's discussion. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to kick off, uh, Anne, with, with you. And I want to talk a little bit about financial stability, because that, in a sense, is the topic du jour um, at the moment. Um, we've seen these liquidity crises in the US and to some extent in, in Europe uh, as well, the European banking sector. I just wonder if you could perhaps reflect on the post-financial crisis regulatory regime um, that I talked about very briefly. And, you know, has the financial system actually got more stable or does this latest bout of instability mean that we sort of need to rip up the regulatory rule book and, and, and sort of rethink our approach to it? Yes, well, I, I thought... Can you hear me? Um, yeah. I thought your introduction was really quite positive and cheerful and with mine, I'm going to be deadly um, dull about it all and depressing, I think. For me, I, my, my really, my lasting memory is of what happened in 2007-8 of the bankers who were convinced that they were about to go to jail. And um, there was just that moment in between the moment in, in August 2007 when interbank lending froze and 2008 Lehman collapsed. There was a moment in the middle of that when the banks thought they were in real trouble and wow, what happened next? <gasps> they were invited in to the Treasury by Gordon Brown and others to sort out the mess that had been their creation. And, and really that, for me, is about what, what's happened since. The actual structure of the macro-financial structure of the global economy remains intact. It's not really been fundamentally altered. There's been some tinkering at the edges. You're quite right that you know commercial banks are better capitalised, so but they're almost irrelevant to the, the financial system at the moment. Uh, big corporations don't go to high street banks to borrow money. Um, they go to the shadow banking sector. And the shadow banking sector <laughs> is, you know, beyond the reach of regulatory democracy and, and very, you know, as designed to be such. So we have, you know, we have this macro financial structure in place. Uh, the imbalances, um, you know, of, of a, a globalized financial system that's scarcely regulated by central banks, but that periodically uh, fails. Um, uh, it's not only s been consolidated as a structure, but it's actually deepened financialization across the world. Now, almost anything that can be financialized, whether it's children's bicycles, adverts on the underground of renting a bicycle um, for your kids, you know, so as they, as they grow out of a small one, you can get the bigger ones and so on. This becomes a financial asset from which to extract rent. And so, you know, finance is, is alighting upon almost anything that is an asset in, in order to be able to extract rent from it. And, and in a sense, has moved away from the business of investing for productive activity. So there's increased market concentration. Uh, there's increased rent seeking. And of course, one of the major features of the post-crisis global economy is the weakening of labor's bargaining power within the economy. And that's not accidental. And that was a deliberate result of this sort of breakdown of coordination between monetary and fiscal policy. So if you remember, that David Cameron was very proudly announced in 2010 
that he was a monetary radical but a fiscal conservative. And this kind of separation of these two major planks uh, for, for managing the economy is what has, land, has resulted in you know, cutbacks in real incomes for a lot of uh, working people, both in the United States and in Europe, uh, but also in cutbacks in the social wage, but cutting back on public spending. So Labour's greatly reduced bargaining power means has, has, has led to... And then, of course, we've got massive and, and obscene rise in inequality, um, again, because the system is now so unbalanced. Um, so, I, as far as I'm concerned, there actually hasn't been uh, sufficient. There has not really been any major change to the architecture of the system. It has actually become more and more imbalanced, and we've had financial crises. Um, you know, uh, you, you say that the banks are, 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 are better capitalized, but we've just had a too big to fail bank fail in Europe, um, Credit Suisse. You know, and we've got a run on the banking system in the United States, and a run that hasn't come to an end, actually. You know, Silicon Valley Bank was the first to go down, but there's others, of the uh, First Republic was a much bigger bank and has gone down, and this run continues as people move money out of the depository institutions and into money market funds and so on. And then we've had major economic crises since the, then as well, and we, you know, talking about the South, you have to think of, uh, well, first of all, we had this EU sovereign debt crisis. We had the Cypriot financial crisis in 2012. We had Venezuela's financial crisis. We had the 2014 Russian financial crisis when oil prices took a nosedive and Russia invaded uh, the Crimea. We've, got the, we've had the Turkish currency and debt crisis since 2018. Argentina is in perennial crisis. Uh, the Lebanese uh, liquidity crisis was a very serious one. The Sri Lankan e uh, economic crisis was, is also a debt crisis. And then there's the 2022 Pakistan economic crisis. So around the world, and ma mainly on the periphery, there have been major financial crises since 2008-9. So, you know, the system is not stabilised. It's become less stable, in my view. And, and the worry now is if big banks like Credit Suisse can go down... Uh, what else is there in store for us? Um, and then, of course, there's the big worry about how to mobilise finance for the uh, for the um, uh, for addressing climate breakdown. And the problem is that that the way the financial system has now got itself set up is to ensure that that any of its investments are de-risked, especially when it comes to climate, de-risked by the taxpayer, by the state but that the state is not applying the penalties that should be applied in order... You know, you, could, you need both carrot and stick, and we are giving loads of carrots but not enough sticks. And, of course, you know, given, given these imbalances, the economic environment, if you like... Chris Giles has got a piece about this today. You know, investors are not willing to invest, They're, especially in Britain. They're very, very nervous, and rightly so, because our, our public authorities haven't created the conditions inducive to investment, productive investment. You know, it's much easier to make a quick capital gain from renting out an asset, some kind of asset, whether it's a tangible and intangible or a synthetic asset, uh, than it is to invest in... And, and, and also because there is no, because there's a general um, d uh, worldwide you know a d a depression of the of the global economy because incomes are falling there really aren't incentives for the private sector to invest productively so my story is a pretty grim okay. miserable one I'm okay. afraid. <laughs> I got that and we'll come back to the the question around around green investment and, and asset managers later. I just want to just follow up quickly with you on the role of central banks because they have played this really important yeah. role. They've become much more important from a macroeconomic perspective with these, these quantitative easing yeah. programs. They've, they've started rescuing types of financial institution that they weren't rescuing pre, yeah. pre the GFC. Um, and, and with the current crisis, is there an argument to say that, that actually they're partly to blame for the current financial instability because of this sudden ratcheting up of, of interest rates, which is, in, in a sense, destabilising these assets, which 
absolutely. So they're to blame because in the first place, you know, they were major drivers of the deregulation process and, um, and careless about it, in fact. So, you know, easy money... Uh, leads to financial crisis 2007-9, which then leads to more easy money in the form of QE and so on. And then that leads, because the central bank thinks that the only weapon with which to address failure is is low interest rates and, and not fiscal policy. Uh, and, and, you know, central bankers argued against the use of fiscal policy at that point. Um, because of that, they really messed up then and, and issued massive amounts of credit, if you like, and, and oversaw the issuance of extraordinary sums of credit um, at very low rates of interest. And the reason we now have bank failures is because suddenly those loans, those debts, those bonds are losing value because the newer bonds are being uh, charged, uh, uh, you know, are issued at a higher rate of interest relative to those bonds. And this is, means that bonds which are used as collateral by the financial system for the leveraging of additional finance are losing their value. This is calling in question their debts and calling their debts into uh, to repayment. So, that, you know, uh, they and, and at this point... Um, you know, having issued all of that new money, if you like, at very low rates, the banks decide to, the central bankers decide to ratchet it up in, in a very aggressive way, without any regard for the real economy. And you know, when when the governor of the Bank of England told the House of Commons yesterday that their model had failed, <laughs> this was this is an extraordinary admission. It's about damn time that it's an admission that is made. But it's an extraordinary sign of weakness by what must be the most powerful institution in the financial system. So, yeah, no, it's gloomy. Grim. OK. <laughs> I'm sure we'll come back to some of those, those themes. Um, Brett, I want to turn to you. Um, we, we've, we've talked about, the, you know, the GFC was essentially a crisis of the banking system. But, but since then, um, as Anne's already alluded to, We've seen the increasing growth of um, non-bank financial intermediaries becoming increasingly important, in particular uh, asset managers. And your new book is about asset managers. Can you can you just give us a sort of brief overview of, of kind of how they've what are they first? What is asset management, and um, you know why they've grown so fast? Why this part of the financial sector has grown so fast over the last sort of 15 years since the since the crisis? Yeah, um, um, it's nice to, to be uh, with you, sort of, uh, I guess, remotely rather than in person, but nonetheless, it's great to be involved, so thanks for that. Um, so the, the first the first question has a very straightforward answer. Um, uh, so asset managers are simply financial institutions that invest principally on behalf of others. So most of the money they invest and in some cases, all of the money they invest, but normally most of it is not their own capital. It's capital with which they are provided by um, other investors, uh, which can be either retail investors. So the likes of you and I, if we have, you know, thousand pounds to invest, we can either invest it ourselves or we can hand it over to an asset manager and they can invest it on our behalf or institutional investors. And obviously, the, the, they include um, things like pension funds. Um, insurance companies and also sovereign wealth funds. So a lot of the investment they do is with uh, is via asset managers rather than directly. So that's all asset managers are: is they are financial institutions that invest principally on behalf of others, and their business model is essentially to earn fees for carrying out that investment. And those fees come in various types. So that's what asset managers are. The reasons for their kind of emergence and growth. I mean, again, there's a very there's a very simple part of the story. So um, just to give an, an indication of that growth, if you go back to around the 1960s, I suppose, um, certainly 1960s, maybe in the 1970s, the amount of capital under management by asset managers globally was less than $1 trillion at that time. Today, it's over $100 trillion. So they have indeed grown massively over the last few decades um and I, and I think the evidence is pretty clear that that the rate of growth has um has um 
advanced quite significantly in the period since the financial crisis. So part of the story about why they've grown is a simple story. And it's a simple story of two parts. So one is just that there's more surplus capital available in the world to be invested. And so, so partly that's a story of pension funds. So pension, uh, so retirement savings, the amount of retirement savings available for investment um, has grown massively, particularly since the 1970s and particularly in the US, but not only there. Um, uh, and also the amount of money um, uh, available for investment by sovereign wealth funds has also grown hugely um, over, over recent decades. So firstly, there's more money available to be invested. And secondly, um, the, the people the, the people in the institutions who um, who have that capital have increasingly over time um, carried out that investment indirectly via asset managers rather than doing it themselves. So if you look at some of the biggest pension funds in the world, there are still certain pension funds, particularly uh, interestingly enough in Canada, that tend to carry out most of their investment themselves. But most of them have increasingly handed over the capital with which they're entrusted to uh, third party asset managers to do that investment on their behalf. So if you if you put those two parts of the story together, more capital and more of it being and more of the investment of that capital being contracted out to third party asset managers, that's how you get from one trillion to 100 trillion uh, during that period. The only thing I'd add to that is 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 the is the fact of of faster investments into the financial crisis, because I think that's absolutely right. You've seen asset managers, which were already growing strongly prior to the financial crisis, kind of growth going into overdrive since the financial crisis. I mean, there's a number of parts to that story, and I don't want to uh, go into it in, in too much uh, detail because we don't have the time for that. But one part of it is relates to the story uh, that you and Anne have already talked about, which was that as you had a kind of a, a clamping down, albeit in, in, in arguably an insufficient one, on commercial and investment banks after the financial crisis, you kind of had a shift towards asset managers. They're a core part of the of what Anne referred to as the shadow banking system, and so the the kind of center of gravity or the center of power within a financial system shifted away from investment banks towards asset managers after the financial crisis because of what happened during the crisis and 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 after it. And then I think the second thing that's very, very important uh, to understand is that the, the, the new macroeconomic environment that you refer to, Josh, over, after, the, after the financial crisis was one that was very conducive to asset managers. A lot of the investment they do, albeit not all of it, but a lot of the investment is leveraged, which, which means uh, is, is, uh, uses large amounts of debt to co-finance their investments along with equity. And with very, very low interest rates, that became a very, very conducive environment for asset managers to operate in. So I think that's the that's the story of growth over that period. Great, and and just to explain to us, um, as you do in your book very well, the, the difference between what what's known as asset manager capitalism um, and what you call asset manager society, which is the focus more of your book. Right. Yeah, that's a that's another good question. So asset manager capitalism is, I mean, it's not really a thing. It's it's a it's a term that has increasingly been used to refer to a, a particular phenomenon, which, which is the fact that a growing proportion of the shares in global capital, so the firms that constitute global capital, is held by asset management institutions, and in particular is held by um, big asset managers led by the so-called big three, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, which, which invest predominantly and much more than 90% through um, passive index funds, which merely track the constituencies of particular market indices. And so what you'd often see is data that, that show that, for example, today, um, I haven't seen the latest data, but something like 20 to 25% of the shares uh, in S and P five hundred com companies in the US are held by funds, one or another fund managed by BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. So the basic argument there is that the big three, in particular, through their passive index funds, are increasingly significant owners of global capital. Hence, asset manager capitalism. And there's all sorts of arguments about 
the argument that that gives these three major investors you know a significant degree of control power whatever you want to term it over global capitalism by virtue of that ownership i'm actually quite skeptical of that argument personally but let's we don't need to go there now um so that's what asset management capitalism is the book that i've that you referred to that i've just published looks at a very different aspect of the asset management industry so what we were talking about there is is occurring principally in public equity markets um and as i said it's the big three asset managers there what i'm looking at in the book is not the ownership is is not my minority stakes in tens of thousands of companies held by these big asset managers it's controlling stakes in not financial assets but real assets held by actually a very different group of asset managers principally whereby um, asset managers have, have come to be increasingly significant owners or direct owners and controlling owners with, with either a wholly owned um, or majority stakes in things like housing. So multifamily apartment blocks, student accommodation, care homes, and not just in housing, but in the various kind of essential infrastructures of social life and hence the term asset manager society. So this is the infrastructures on which daily social life requires to be possible. So the production and reproduction of daily social life from um, schools and hospitals, um, energy infrastructures, water and wastewater infrastructures, transportation infrastructures, so the roads we drive on, the parking systems we use. So basically, asset manager society refers to the fact that the infrastructures and residential real estate in which social life, daily social life is fundamentally embedded is increasingly controlled by asset management institutions such as uh, Blackstone, uh, Brookfield from Canada and Macquarie from Australia. They're the big three that I focus on in the book. Great. And then final question for you is around this sort of short termism problem that I that I mentioned. Um, is, is your view that this new arrangement is capable of the kind of longer term investments that we need, for example, for the the, the net zero transition um, or, or, or the, uh, you know, the need, for example, in developing countries for massive investment in transport infrastructure and energy infrastructure? Or is there is the is the business model not not set up for that kind of long term investment? Despite the fact that, for example, pension funds, in theory, have long term liabilities and should be looking for you know, long term assets to match those liabilities. Yeah, so the, the, I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question relatively uh, briefly because I know I've taken up enough time already. But the, con the conclusion I came to in doing the book was that while um, in theory and in principle, those types of institutions are capable of, of that kind of long-term investment, long-term custodianship, uh, and so on. And while there are certainly, I think, examples of asset management, private sector asset management institutions that do that, I, I would say the evidence is very, very clear that the industry at large, when you're talking about this type of hands-on ownership of specific infrastructures and specific residential real estate, is overwhelmingly short-termist in, out, in outlook um, and, in, and, and in practice. So while the potential is there in certain parts of the industry, and while they certainly talk a good game in many cases about you know, offering perpetual capital vehicles, patient um, um, evergreen investing structures and so on, those tend to be very much the ex exclusion, uh, exception, sorry, to the rule. Uh, so I, I take a fairly dim view on that based on the research that I've done. Great. Okay, thanks, Brett. I'll turn to you now, um, Ingrid. Um, get the microphone, thanks. So, um, I mean, you've obviously worked for quite a while in different asset managers, unlike Anne and, and Brett, so you've got the, the inside um, uh, experience of that. I, I guess I I'd kind of firstly want to ask you, you know, is that, is that is, do you share Brett's sort of scepticism about about asset management and then i mean obviously you're working in in green finance and sustainable finance where um there has been this this huge effort to find um develop policy frameworks that enable this kind of investment enable more green green investment from private capital markets 
Um, and so maybe you could you could sort of reflect, I guess, on the extent to which you know things like you know what what are the challenges here with with green taxonomies? I know you, you've been playing a leading role in, in a, a UK green taxonomy, and and so yeah, what are the broader kind of role of the state, I guess, in, in getting the kind of finance that we've, we've just talked about into those sectors we need it for, to, for the green transition? Um, yeah, absolutely. So I, I definitely recognise the picture that has been painted by Brett. Um, I was trying to, I, I actually worked in asset management both before and after the financial crisis, but I self-selected organisations that I thought were much more purpose focused. Um, and I think they both sort of reflect the wide range of different roles and functions within this, this quite sort of broad term. But I think when I think about what are the challenges faced by policymakers now, given that many of our pensions are invested through these asset managers, it's value for money. So these are very high fee generating um, business models um, that obviously is taken those fees are taken off return on our investments, which then mean there's less in the pension pot at the end of the day. Um, the, in actual fact, the green agenda, the sustainable finance agenda in part has been about trying to increase transparency, accountability and purpose led investing through um, integrating things like uh, ESG considerations. But then with that, we've ended up with concerns about greenwashing. So we keep sort of layering uh, intervention upon intervention um, to try and address those issues. But just to break it down, um, within the asset management space, there's broadly public markets, so equity and debt. Um, the green bond market, I think, is a real triumph, cumulatively 2.3 trillion now um, in issuances, <coughs> all with purposeful green investment. Um, but on the equity side, I think it's probably the less, the least interesting part of what's going on in this asset management um, space. We do continue to face um, uh, issues with short termism in terms of most uh, asset managers will be looking at short term quarterly performance because that's what your fees are generated off. It's how your benchmarks are against other providers. And I think the best we can do there is expect our asset managers to actually engage with the underlying companies on responsible uh, business issues from climate to um, modern slavery to anything else you might might choose. But from a um, from a climate perspective, I think there's much more that's interesting going on in private markets. So that's going to be venture capital, private equity and um, direct lending. And the reason that's interesting is because this, this is the money that is going to be backing the new business models, the new technologies. They're going to be looking much more at the detail of these projects. Um, you know, how it might be sustainable aviation fuel plants, it might be carbon capture and storage, it might be um, investment in sites like the King's Cross redevelopment, which was the result of a 10 year collaboration with the local authority to deliver social and environmental purpose as well as financial returns. But that is what this broader sustainable finance agenda ultimately is, is trying to achieve, is let's use the scrutiny that comes with um, a requirement to take environmental, social and governance considerations into account to make sure we're actually delivering outcomes that work both for people and for the environment. Okay. And just, just in terms of, of uh, specifically the, the policies that, that governments can introduce or central banks can introduce to sort of speed this process up because we, we are in a bit of a race against time here, particularly in regard to, to climate. I mean, what's your reflections on, you know, for example, the, the, the sort of task force on climate related financial disclosures, uh, the, the sort of scenario analysis that's been going on, the, uh, and also the, the, the green taxonomies, which is obviously your area where you've been playing a leading role? So there's a bit of a pull and a push, and I think the way we've tried to approach this, so I have been involved in both the EU discussions, I was a member of the high level expert group on sustainable finance which was which created the sustainable finance action plan from which all these policies including the taxonomy have emerged that approach has been incredibly prescriptive and while i think um, some of the regulation around uh, you know asset management disclosure asset manager disclosures on sustainability have been helpful in putting a rocket up some of these firms in terms of thinking how are they taking esg issues into account 
they're so prescriptive that actually what you've seen is rather a tick box exercise and production of reports and outputs rather than any sort of major shift in how um, investment happens. What we've done in the UK is to take a, a softer approach through things like the Climate Financial Risk Forum, which is a collaboration between the PRA and the FCA, working with the industry to say, OK, we've got the TCFD. How do we now start to implement that? So I was involved in that at Hermes. We led work on disclosures and actually use the opportunity to work with our peers to figure out how we do this better and how we tackle things like governance through the lens of the TCFD requirements, we suddenly realised actually the functionality on the risk committee wasn't there to be able to take some of these results of analyses up to board to then consider in as part of our strategic business planning. So I do think that that collaborative approach is smart. You then come out at the end of that process with a piece of regulation that's been pre-tested with the people who will have to abide by it and we've got a better chance of getting it right. So we're now finally seeing the TCFD enter into law as a result of that um, process. The role of the taxonomy, which is a group I chair for, chair, chair for Treasury, um, is actually about directing capital to the endpoint. So back to that point about greenwashing, there are many different definitions of green, some of them more solid than others. Um, and it's quite challenging for um, an investor that isn't versed in environmental, climate or technology issues to know what a good definition of green is. So that's really all it is, is a, a set of dictionary definitions of green um, couched in financial terms that um, can be used to report against in the context of the TCFD, transition plans if you've got them, green fund reporting, um, where there's that sort of stamp of authenticity. Going back to 2015, when I was in the uh, EU high-level expert group on sustainable finance, I really remember a conversation with some of the European banks on sustainability. And they said, we do want to do this thing, we just don't know what it is. So I think that's the question it is, it is seeking to answer. I think the other thing that's quite useful is in the absence of real economy policies to connect capital to where it needs to go. Things like taxonomies are quite helpful um, because it steps into that breach where the real economy policy doesn't exist. And we are also, just a final comment, already hearing um, anecdotally of um, the taxonomy affecting the access to and cost of capital for companies on the green side and on the brown side with banks competing to lend to taxonomy aligned businesses, so insulation businesses, because it helps them green their own books and they've got their own transparency uh, requirements there. So I think it is one helpful intervention among many interventions that are going to be needed to rewire a whole financial system in the right direction. Okay. Um, you want to come in, huh? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say one of the, in that in that long tedious introduction of yours that you failed to mention is that I'm a, a member of the Scottish Government's Just Transition Commission, and what it's what the experience what the experience of being on that commission has taught me is that what we have a problem here of is the scale the scale of capital the scale of investment that's needed and all of what's happening at the moment is still too little and too slow. In it. Now, when I think about carbon capture, it's clear to me that that's still pie in the sky, really. And, I, you know, we have oil companies on the, the, the Just Transition Commission as well. All the Aberdeen oil companies are on the commission, and indeed so are the trade unionists who are all, um, you know, work on oil rigs of, of, of Aberdeen. Um, you know, carbon capture is pie in the sky still, and the scale of investment needed to make it work is way, way beyond the risk that most uh, asset managers or banks or anyone is willing to take, really. And so what it's shown me, and, and, and what has to happen in Scotland, is that there's got to be a major restructuring of the whole economy away from its dependence on uh, North Sea oil, right? Massive transformation. And the cost of that can only be borne by the state. You know, all of these efforts by the private sector to to do this seem to me to be, you know, just uh, 
<laughs> Teardrops, <laughs> really, in the ocean. I think Ingrid wants to come back. <laughs> exact numbers off the top of my head but yesterday JP Morgan announced the largest ever investment in a carbon capture and storage plant in the US off the back of the IRA incentive so it is starting to happen. Yeah it's starting to happen but, but the science and the technology is not there you know. It's I want to I want to uh, just get Brett in here Brett because I, I know your your next book um, is is on this topic of of green green finance and, and the role of 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 private markets, and you've um, you've written a couple of really interesting articles, actually, about this. Um, uh, well, I know you wrote an article, sort of critiquing the disclosure uh, paradigm, and a, and another article, and you and you've talked a lot about this this de-risking um, paradigm. Um, can can you give us your your reflections um, just on on you know what is what are the limits of the private sector in supporting the net zero transition and, and do you agree with that? I guess that the state has to play a a much bigger role to really make it happen. The short answer is that yes, I do. I do agree with Anne. Um, I, I guess I have um, three main, and I guess they're connected to each other, concerns about the role of the private sector, um, including the asset management industry, but not only the asset management industry. I mean, so just, just to run through those relatively briefly i think the first one is one we've is one you already alluded to with your earlier question and which and which i sort of briefly answered but also ingrid also referred to when she talked about uh incentive structures and so on which is just which is this kind of um mismatch of time horizons between the the very long term perspective that is clearly required of any sort of um engagement slash policy slash investment vis-a-vis the climate crisis and particularly vis-a-vis climate infrastructure whether that's infrastructure of mitigation or adaptation and the and the time horizons of the private sector including the asset management sector and there ironically there was a you know the 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 the, the paper or the speech that first really called attention to this was a was a well a very famous or infamous speech by um, uh, the then governor of the Bank of England, uh, Mark Carney, back in 2015, which many people will have read or heard, where he referred to this as the tragedy of the horizon, where he talked about the long-term horizon associated with the climate crisis and the short-term horizon of many institutions of the capitalist economy, including actually central banks, he argued, um, but certainly the private, the private financial sector. And I say it's ironic because since leaving the Bank of England, Mark Carney obviously rocked up at one of the world's biggest asset, private sector asset managers, Brookfield Asset Management, um, which is principally a short term uh, investor, including in climate infrastructure. So very, very ironic, if not uh, very, very surprising. So the time horizons issue is one. I think the second one relates to another issue that's already been touched on by both you uh, and Ingrid, which is the issue of disclosure. So kind of one of the, just to kind of um, sort of step back for one second for people in, in the audience who, who aren't aware of this, but one of the kind of main logics behind um, governments giving a lot of responsibility to the, to the finance, to the private finance sector and then financial markets for kind of shepherding the global economy away from its, its historic brown configuration towards a green configuration. One of the logics is that if you if you encourage or even compel private sector actors to disclose the nature of their um, exposure to climate risks, like for example, exposure to having stranded assets that in a green future will be worthless, then you enable the, the financial markets to kind of do this efficient work of shepherding um, of shepherding capital away from its brown configuration. You know, the theory is that they will, if they are in possession of that information, they will, you know, they will discipline brown companies through a higher cost of capital. And so that the, the markets kind of work in this perfectly efficient way to achieve those outcomes if they're in possession of the of the relevant information but but my view is that that 
and it's not only my view. I mean, it's it's a view that I think has become pretty much consensus, at least amongst heterodox economists in the last couple of decades, is that that completely misunderstands the, the actual real nature of financial markets. And that they don't work in anything like the way that that theory presumes and, and the institutions that participate in those markets don't work in that way at all. So that's the second one. The third one, and this is this is kind of where the focus of the of the forthcoming book that you refer to is, is 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 in a way even simpler still, which is simply this, which is that green capitalism in general and renewables in particular, and that's kind of the focus of the book, is just not a very good business. It's not it's not a very profitable business. Um, and as the last twelve months in particular have shown. You know, with with Saudi Aramco and Shell and Exxon reporting hundreds of billions of dollars worth of profits, is that like it or not, fossil fuels remain a vastly more profitable business than running a wind farm or running a solar facility. And we may not like that, but that's a reality. And that's precisely why the state continues to need to de-risk investment in renewables through whether it's tax credits in the US or feed in tariffs in the Netherlands or contracts for difference in the UK. You know, I'm, I'm definitely not one of those critics of de-risking that says, well, we shouldn't be de-risking because it's not really necessary. It's completely necessary. The state needs to de-risk those investments because otherwise private capital will not invest because these are just not attractive businesses to invest in. So my, so my concern with with de-risking which as i say i think is necessary is 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 firstly that is is firstly that you get you get um the the the, the state takes on that risk and as Anne said earlier there's no sticks to print typically to go along with the carrots but also the state doesn't get any rewards so it de-risks it but all the rewards that come from that eventually accrued to the private sector and to private sector to shareholders. Um, and then secondly, and, and I think even more importantly, is that even with all the de-risking that's going on, the private sector is still not going remotely fast enough. So, you know, you know, even with all the de-risking that's going on, and even with the cost of solar and, and wind technologies having you know, plummeted by 80, 90 percent to historically low levels, to the point where the cost of generating uh, through wind or solar is cheap is as cheap or cheaper than um, gas or coal-fired power stations. The private sector is still not going remotely fast enough on sufficient a scale to avert the crisis. And as Anne says, the only actor in the in in the, the economy that we have uh, with the capacity to scale up at the level and at the pace that's required to come anywhere close to what we need is the state. Okay, Ingrid, I, I wonder, you know, if you'd like to come back on any of of that. Um, I guess what one one question would be: you may or may not agree the state has to play a bigger role, but you know, have we, do we need some different tools to to get the, the private sector to move faster? I mean, one tool that most economists would favour actually is just carbon taxes. That 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 would that would immediately have an impact in terms of changing in incentive structure. Another, you know, tool is is just financial regulation to just stop lending to, for example, you know, firms that are extracting new fossil fuel uh, from, from the ground. That we the sort of consensus that that you know that is is not compatible. I mean, wh where do you, where do you wh where's your thoughts lie on those sort of bigger interventions? I guess. So I, I think we've got a terminology mismatch in in terms of how I see the world and how Brett sees the world, I think, around this point of de-risking. So when I think of public funds de-risking investment, I see it as addressing very specific um, price risks, technology risks, construction risks, wh whatever it is. Um, and it's about putting public money in where usually there's no data for a project finance person in a bank to be able to plug into their models to know how to price their capital to be able to lend. But there is another piece to this we're talking about, which is um, what I'd call the who pays question. So the um, reason why Saudi Aramco has been very profitable is because oil and gas price is spiked because of the war in Ukraine. And suddenly an industry that was looking very unprofitable started to look very attractive. Part of that 
is due to propping up through all kinds of fossil fuel subsidies which don't levelise the playing field. But actually what we're seeing globally is the cost of renewables are coming down and down and down and are cost competitive against coal and gas. But they used to be quite expensive because they were new and we hadn't got up the technology learning curve. And so the who pays question comes down to are you going to put the charge on consumers or is the government going to pay to get this technology out into the market? And that there's just a real difference in my mind around how we use public capital in those two instances. Now, why that's important is um, when I think about greening the financial system, I think we have to remember that the financial system is only going to be as green as the economy it finances. So getting all that real economy policy right, getting the fossil fuel subsidies out of the system and targeting public funds to the new businesses, the new technologies we want to see is really, really um, critical. The question then is how do you do that as efficiently as possible? Carbon taxes are very popular, but they are a blunt instrument. Um, the reason we've seen them replaced in supporting the energy sector is because if you have a fixed price, what that will incentivise a private sector actor to do is deliver the outcome at the cheapest cost possible. And what we saw in the early stages of the renewable energy market in the UK was an excessive focus on energy to waste because that was just the cheapest thing to do. And what you then started to see was an iteration of the policy instrument, the renewables obligation in this case, to start to differentiate between the different kinds of technologies we wanted to see, onshore wind, offshore wind, solar, to get those technologies out in the world, um, costs coming down. So we're now at a place where we see um, auctions and firms bidding in under contracts for difference to deliver renewable energy at the lowest cost possible. And I think that's a brilliant outcome. When we look at some of these really nitty gritty risk sharing questions in uh, uh, newer sectors like sustainable aviation fuel and area we're working in now, I think what we have seen as a result of GFANS and the net zero commitments is a real significant willingness of the banks to come to the table. Um, they want to deliver on these net zero objectives. They want to do these deals, but they can't throw the project finance rule book out. And the other effect we're seeing from all the work of the uh, Bank of England and things like TCFD is different conversations happening now in credit committees around what the cost of capital should be on green versus brown. Um, and I'm really heartened to see um, increasing flexibility uh, amongst the banks in particular in terms of what risk they are now prepared to take because I think they recognise the risk of not shifting balance sheets into the green space is higher than the, the risk of, uh, you know, um, maybe putting money into a, a technology that was earlier stage than they might have done in the past. But we aren't going to get away from some public risk sharing being needed, but I think we need to get smarter, move away from grants, move into things like first loss capital, guarantees. Sorry, what's that? So where you have a debt structure, for example, you might want to put a slice of um, public finance in as the first loss debt to then top it up with private capital. And again, it will be back to credit committees work on data. They want to know these technologies work if there's no, if there's no data. Somebody has to so take this is kind risk. of blended finance. That type, is what that is models. what blended finance mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. um, so getting smarter about um, targeting contingent risk as much as um, possible, and trying to flush that out through um, data uh, engineer. Uh, sorry, engineering um, data pilots or pilot scale plant, or all those sorts of things, which the state is so good at. Brett, Brett did you want to come back on any of that? So. Bit of a challenge maybe to your thesis there but. no i mean i think that I, I i i totally hear what ingrid's saying um i mean i think one thing that <laughs> one thing i would come back on is that um you know in the research for the new because i because i think this is sometimes um there's there's a there's a, a view out there which i'm which i'm not sure i totally agree with there's a you know having in the research i did for the book that that I'm working that I've been working on now. I spoke to a lot of bankers um, in and around, particularly around the renewable space, but not only the renewable space. Um, 
And what, one thing that was very, very clear to me is the thing is what is is what I think Ingrid was referring to, which is that there is there is a there is actually a great willingness and desire amongst um, at least significant parts of the financial sector, particularly I think in Europe, maybe maybe somewhat less so in North America and in the US, um, to su to support green investments of one type or another. And and so I don't think there's a shortage of willingness. And I also don't think then there's clearly not a shortage of available capital, um, you know. But where, but where I where I do come back to um, it is the is the fact that there is for sure a shortage of what are deemed to be um, attractive investment opportunities. And I think that's that's the that's the real problem, which is just that is that the the level of profitability that these actors consider acceptable or desirable is, is is typically not there often even with the state acting in and providing some of those guarantees and loss taking mechanisms that England referred to I think the only other thing I'd say quickly is is yeah of course um of course the spike in in um oil and gas prices that resulted from the um that resulted from uh, the Ukraine war um boosted the profits of the of the big fossil fuel companies but it was but it was already a very very profitable business and it only really looked anything remotely close to marginal in a very very short window at the beginning of covid when commodity prices collapsed to you know 15 20 dollars a barrel and they only stayed there for a matter of weeks and within you know within a few weeks they were back above 50 dollars a barrel and Saudi Aramco was again generating, you know, $25 billion of, of profit a quarter. So, I, I, you know, I don't, and, and so I, I think that, yes, Ukraine made a difference, but it's not like it made a difference to an unprofitable business. Great, thanks. I'm just going to give Anne a final word um, before we open it up to, to Q&A. Um, and, and, I mean, you've written about the Green New Deal, you know, extensively, um, you've made a very strong case for much more expansionary fiscal policy to support green transition and other goals. We saw during COVID what the state could do yeah. when it was, you know, when, when you had central banks and ministers of finance coordinating yes. and, and saving whole sectors and doing like sector specific interventions to save the, the sectors most important to us, the health sector, infrastructure, you know, education. What, why hasn't, why haven't we now been able to continue with that kind of highly aggressive state intervention and, and fiscal expansion post COVID? Why are we why are we now back in this situation where we, we seem to be dependent on, on private finance to solve these these problems? I, I, that's a really big Sorry. big question uh, to throw at me at this stage. But I mean, to be honest, I think the way the system is currently constructed, which is to marketize everything at a global level beyond the reach of the state, makes it really, I mean, even in the case of COVID, we, an enormous amount was done to support the population, but the fixing of prices by the global pharma sector, you know, was something really beyond, even though, Yes, yeah, so even though the state had subsidized and supported, you know, the innovations that led to the development of vaccine, nevertheless, you know, these, these markets are beyond the reach. So it's quite hard for the state to work with global capital because global capital really doesn't want to be confined to borders, doesn't want to be confined to a regulatory framework, you know, because you can, be, you know, it's much more profitable to be able to move quickly in and out of, um, you know, a, very profitable yeah, it's much actually much more profitable to make capital gains from rent seeking than it is to get in to dirty one's hands and get involved with the state in actually kind of re restructuring the Scottish economy um, and so I think what we really I mean my my solutions are Keynesian and radical which is that um, we have to do something about capital mobility and we have to re you know give re reinstate powers within the state to manage the rate of interest on capital. You know, this cost of capital story is something that the central bank could really play a lot of a big important role in. And we have to be able to, to if the state is to take a more um, interventionist role, it's got to be able to have to manage capital flows. And 
and I know that that you know five ten years ago one wasn't allowed to mention capital mobility and the need to manage capital flows, but it it is becoming a little more fashionable these days, and more and more institutions are talking about it because we're losing the ability of the democratic state to respond to a, a crisis of the of the people because because it hasn't got management of the finance needed for for the investment in in meeting those concerns so i'm you know it's a really big story that you're asking me to talk about in this and last you minute need capital controls because otherwise you can't control the domestic financial sector and steer it in the direction you yeah need to first of all you cannot con control interest rates or manage interest rates. i don't like the word control um you know i think you know it's as if you were asking you know the chief executive of apple to hand over you know, the management of his business to the free market, really. He would never dream of doing that. He wants to manage his business. And, and, but the state has been so designed as to say, look, no, well, I'm not going to manage this. I'm going to rely on the goodwill. And there is a lot of goodwill amongst bankers and financiers. They've all got young people, young children, and they're all worried about the green, green issues. Yeah, there's a lot of goodwill there. But the system really doesn't make it possible just for that to, to have the impact. So we need to change the system, is what I think, in order to get there. Thank you. Change the system. So that's a good launching point for the audience. <laughs> Change the system and pet for Substack. There's a little promotion for you. OK, so we'll take uh, three or four questions at a, at a time. We'll start with a gentleman at the back. Please say who you are if, and, and try and keep it as a question rather than a statement. Thank you. I'll keep it brief. Uh, my name is Hamish Stewart, and I work with EcoAct. The question is regards to the, the topic of the session around governance of finance. Could each of the speakers please indicate what is the most significant structural change they would like to see in, in, that would lead to more positive outcomes in the way the finance system is governed? So what is one structural change you'd like to see? And uh, you know whether or not it's politically possible is another thing. But just if you could identify the big change that you think is needed, that okay. would be great. Thanks. Thank you. And then the gentleman here with the blue jacket. Hi, Omar Omar, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Omar Salam, I'm general counsel at Algebra. We're a sustainable finance uh, app, and I just wanted to ask about um, from a financial regulation point of view. I'm a financial regulation lawyer. Um, do you agree that this comes down to looking at the roots of the uh, the kind of ideological roots here? Um, it, you know, in terms of what was being referred to about how um, these. Um, uh, for example, the the presumption that by disclosing risks, it will be possible for um, to it will that that will change market uh, behavior. You know that obviously goes back to kind of basic information asymmetry kind of ideology. Ideology and likewise, that's the approach for to the financial regulation that's been put in place more generally. Um, and so, um, would you agree that you know from a financial regulation point of view, we need to move away from looking at it as market fixing to a more public value approach because the result of that, of the current approach is, well, let's just do some disclosures and that will fix everything. Okay, thanks. And uh, do we have any ladies? Yes, let's have a lady at the front, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm so sorry I was late, so I missed quite a lot of the uh, introduction. But it seems to me that, uh, Brett, you might have the tail and, and perhaps you the trunk of the elephant in the room, uh, <laughs> in the sense that um, the big three are uh, the problem in terms of holding the assets, and the big four are the problem in terms of uh, hollowing out the government uh, and government infrastructure and government management capacity that would actually manage what you would like to see happen. Question. Okay, and then we'll take one more gentleman here. Thanks very much, because I had to go anyway. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Donald Brown from the University of Sussex Business School. Um, something you sort of touched upon um, around what's often known as the carbon bubble. So, you know, this huge potential for stranded assets in the financial system resulting from fossil fuel assets that can never be burned. I suppose a little question to Anne about her crystal ball. Is this the next financial crisis? Is it going to when it when might it happen? How quickly and what can we do about it? Thanks. Okay, great. So, um, Anne, why don't we kick off with you and maybe you could speak straight to um, 
to that question and, and the structural change question. Yeah. I think capital mobility is the issue and that managing capital flows is terribly important. But I think really what I want to say is this, is that our, our, our economy is oriented towards the global economy. We, we're all export-oriented. Uh, you know, uh, the current ideology is that an economy has to be export-oriented. In my view, <laughs> it's mainly to satisfy the interests of the, the, of the global financial system, um, to generate the hard currency, if you like, to deal with debts and so on. That orientation towards the global economy means that you're not concerned with the domestic economy. So the, the great change that has been brought about since the collapse of Bretton Woods is the one of, you know, the economies must be focused on effectively the finance sector, not on the domestic economy. We have to have a complete turn towards the... And the reason I, I think that's important is that we're getting it anyway. And we're getting it in a very reactionary, protectionist way. So what we see now is the Polanyan phenomenon of, you know, the people saying, look, if you can't manage these global markets and protect me from the impact on my job, on my income, on the, my ability to have a roof over my head and to send my kids to university, then I'm going to look to a strong man or woman to do that for me. So we can either take what I regard to be the more intelligent route of managing these capital flows, or we can just sit back and wait for effectively fascism to 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 build up um, barriers and in particular protect. And we're seeing, we're seeing the United States become more in protectionist by the day. Uh, we're seeing hostility rising between the United States and China, trade wars leading to uh, a real wars. You know, so so we we can we we're at a point I think where the tectonic plates of the financial system are shifting, and they are shifting in a way that I think is profoundly worrying. We need to be a little more intelligent about this and say we have to subordinate the interests of finance to the interests of society in order to maintain some kind of stability, political and otherwise. Those are big things to ask, you know, of our politicians who don't really know what's going on, it seems to me. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, Ingrid, um, would you like to take the question um, on uh, disclosures? Because um, I know you've, you've, you've worked on this. Uh, uh, I think the, the question was, was, was sort of about, is this a, a certain paradigm? You called it market fixing paradigm. Um, I guess I would sort of add to that question. Is there a sort of fundamental epistemological problem here with, with this concept in the sense that um, the idea of, of, of getting banks or firms to it, disclose their exposures to climate risk assumes that it's possible to sort of attach meaningful risks or, or probabilities to those risks. I mean, I mean, that in a sense is the definition of risk as opposed to uncertainty. You can risks you can attach meaningful probabilities to, you can adjust your positions, you can hedge your positions. Is climate risk or environmental risk, whatever we want to call it, actually better understood as as uncertainty, you know, given that it's subject to things like whether Donald Trump wins the US election or whether some new technology comes along or, or you know, all of these sort of things that really are subject to uncertainty. Thanks. Um, I'm going to tackle the question in a different way and be annoying, okay. which is that the, um, the philosophy be behind the disclo disclosures um, approach in the UK and the EU is actually about driving operational and business change. And the disclosures are just an output of that. So through going through the process of having to think through, in the case of TCFD, your, your uh, strategy, your operational um, risks and then report against metrics and targets, you get people thinking about things they hadn't thought about before. It's the same with rules around ESG integration. Any person who is not looking at the world, the real world, in a financialized way will be really aware of things like water risk and climate risk and social unrest. So the result of these disclosure regimes is actually to start to see massive hiring of a range of professionals you never would have seen inside of these institutions who, alongside the credit analysts, will be looking at these risks as well. Um, and the other positive output you get is, um, alongside the appropriate pricing of capital, is you start to see engagement. 
by these institutions with the companies themselves, but increasingly with governments to say, actually, you've got to do something about this. So massive engagement around the climate agenda, but um, Amazonian deforestation, all sorts of initiatives are, are growing up with this very powerful lobby now actually having a voice at the table. I also just want to turn to this, what's the most important change we need to see question, because I think it's an important one. I think we need to see um, uh, long-term incentive plans factor in social and environmental goals. Once you put it in somebody's bonus, they're going to be really motivated to start to make changes happen, in, in particular on the sort of deal financing side that we work in at the GFI. These deals are really hard to put together. We've been sitting around the table for um, nearly a year talking about a sustainable uh, import guarantee structure with the government and most people will work on a multi-week time frame within banks. So this stuff is just going to happen off the side of the desk or not at all until we make it their jobs and I think incentives is the way to go. Thanks. Uh, finally, Brett, um, there was a question I think you probably best addressed around the, the big four and the, the big three, I think it was, around, around yeah, asset the managers. Okay, I'm hoping you've understood the question better than me, Brett, but we can ask the lady here to repeat it if you, would you like me to? I didn't really understand the, qu the question, I have to confess. Maybe it isn't a question that is, 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 is a question to ask. I, I apologize in that case. I just had the feeling that given that we have a problem in terms of the governments that Anne would like to take more of a helm, uh, being sort of hollowed out by having uh, the infrastructure basically denuded by uh, or outside consultancies, the big four, and given that the uh, the big three that would be providing the capital that could drive forward su significant investments uh, and de-risks in themselves probably uh, are actually not interested in in road mapped copex and uh, and uh, opex kind of um, um, <clears throat> costed uh, long-term projects, we're sort of really in a sort of place where we're stuck in the middle. That's what's sort of the question. Right, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I get that. I mean, I can try and just, I don't know whether I'll be able to answer it, but just to offer, a, I guess, an observation on that. But also, on I think, just also the, the question about uh, the structural change in financial government. I mean, I think on the, the first question, um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting observation. Um, and I, I suppose the, the person who would be best positioned to answer that is probably Mariana, given that, that that's what her new book is about. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's striking that, um, the, it, it, you know, in recent decades, governments have um, kind of outsourced everything um, that that can be reasonably or unreasonably outsourced, um, including obviously a lot of the 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 types of expertise that you're referring to, but but obviously they've also I think the the point I would come back to is that they've also and I think this is this is where we're at really today and this connects to, to everything that that Anne was saying earlier. Governments I think have really to a significant extent they have outsourced responsibility for addressing the climate crisis to the private sector and to and to financial markets and i think one of the striking things is that if you if you talk to um lots of participants in the financial markets they're not particularly happy with that i think a lot of them want the government to kind of take back more responsibility uh for um making decisions around what should and shouldn't be done and in ways in which they're done um, but of, but obviously, as you say, if you have a if you have a government where a lot of the necessary expertise has been hollowed out to private sector institutions that are that have their own particular incentives and so on, then that's difficult. So I think that's a, that's a that's a very um, astute observation. Again, I'm not sure that there's a there's necessarily a question to be answered there, but I think that's right. On the question of structural change, question, I always find questions like that really really difficult because I'm. I'm one of those academics who, who is much more comfortable criticizing and finding problems with things than um, coming up with, with 
um, useful and clever ways of addressing them, which is why I'm, which is why I always have the greatest admiration for, for, for people like Ingrid who actually try to actually work with the relevant institutions and try to change behaviours and incentives and so on. Um, but I guess all I would say there is that is that given that almost all my research in recent years has been focused in one way or another on questions of ownership, for me, um, if there was one thing I would like to see in terms of um, a structural change um, in relation to financial governance, whether the, whether this is specifically governance or not, I'm not sure, but I would like to see much more aggressive um, governance related specifically to the question of ownership and what types of actors are able to own specific types of assets. Like to me, to go back to the asset management example, to me, it's just it's just not right that things like housing that are essential to people's everyday lives should be owned by investment funds that have that, are, that have fixed term time horizons of say eight to ten years at the end of which they have to sell those assets to me that those two things are fundamentally incompatible to, to, with one another so i would like to see much more interventionist government and governments in terms of what types of assets can be owned can be owned by what types of institutions we live in a world now where it's kind of open season where basically any one or any, or any any type of actor can own pretty much anything they like within um relatively um feeble rules and regulations that restrict that to a to a very very modest degree and i'd like to see much more active governments in that respect thanks brett um more questions um Oh, yeah, we're going to have some questions from the internet because we've got a big online audience. Hi, uh, I'm Manuel. I'm an MBA student here in IAPB. Uh, so we have a lot of different questions, but we have a lot of questions about public policies. Uh, so maybe summarizing up that, uh, Claudia was asking if have economic incentives have been effective in promoting sustainability and economic health, and if you have like some lessons learned from the policies that have been implemented. Uh, also... People were asking of like concrete examples of investments or structure that are currently working. Uh, Tobias was asking about the role of central banks and money creation. If could money be directed directly to green sectors? And Artishan was asking why do fossil fuel companies continue to receive subsidies? Okay, uh, let's take one or two from the audience. Yeah, Matthias. Um, Matthias Tager from uh, Work Business School and Grantham Institute here at LSE. Um, question, I think, primarily to Anne, but to everyone um, as well. You mentioned how central banks have become uh, weak or have had this moment of, uh, of apparent weakness. My question is, how um, can they become strong again? Is it a matter of um, inducing intellectual change uh, through, for instance, academics like like Josh and his team? Is it about changing mandates? Is that the entirely wrong approach? And does the government need to claw back um, capacities and uh, and responsibilities that are now with unelected technocrats? So, yeah, thank you. Okay, and uh, we'll take one more gentleman at the front here. Uh, David Anderson. Um uh, chairman of Norwich Credit Union and Eastern Director of Abcol. <coughs> um, at our lowly level of a credit union, what can we do to implement your ideas into our policies, or do we have to wait for government to enable us? Okay. Um, uh, Anne, let's start with you on the central bank. So we've had two, two questions on central banks there, which are sort of related. One is, you know, should central banks be just more directly investing in the, in the green transition yeah. you know maybe through through you know green qe is one one of the topics that, that comes up again and again um and then the the related sort of question was was just about their role you know how should we you know change what they do is it mandates is it they need a different intellectual paradigm or or, or should government just take back more control and fiscal policy i guess have a, a bigger role maybe yeah so i think i mean <clears throat> Part of the ideological shift that's taken place since the 1940s, basically since Keynes, is that in, central banks should be independent uh, and that, you know, coordination twixt uh, monetary and fiscal policy is not necessary. Um, 
And so we have the situation which I think central banks now see as their major concern, the management and the stability of the financial system, not of the of the economy, the, the domestic economy. And this is part of a process of depoliticizing money, as if money were some sort of uh, 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 objective thing which you know clever people understand and and uh, and that is not political and money is incredibly political uh, can i recommend Stephen eich's new book uh, called the uh, the currency of politics which is about you know the need to re-politicize the whole question of money um, and I think the fact that civil servants, because they're all civil servants, they're all on the payroll, the government's payroll, should be making these decisions which have disastrous impacts on society, is quite wrong. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't want to play the game of s civil servants being independent. They're not independent, you know. Um, uh, Mr. Powell, Jerome Powell, is appointed by the, prime, uh, the President of the United States. And his is a very a political appointment. So I think we've got to, you know, A, return to the politicization of money, and B, central bankers, civil servants cannot be independent of democratic states. And it's what has, you know, the hollowing out of democracy is, for me, the really big issue. Um, that actually, you know, the public, the state, is rendered impotent in the face of these tremendous forces um, of which the central bank is supporting and subsidizing and so on. So I think it does need an ideological shift. We've got to start talking about the fact that um, this is an arm of the state and, and, the, and it's an arm of, in our case, the democratic state and should therefore be accountable democratically. And it's not. I mean, uh, these civil servants walk around in incredible arrogance and certainty. So when yesterday the governor admitted to his, his models being broken, uh, you know, this was this was unknown. It's unknown for them to acknowledge and to be accountable for their failed policies. Um, but then, you know, um, so so yeah, end to end, uh, independence of central banks. And, and I, I mean, there's a whole lot more that central banks can do to support investment in the green in economy. Um, but I don't think I've got time to go into okay. that. Okay, we'll move on to Ingrid. Um, I mean, welcome to pick up on that point. But but the question I thought might be good for you to think about was the the fossil fuel subsidies. You know, why have we not made more progress in in ending that, and and how can we do that? And then there was also a question from the from the World Wide Web on. Um, investment, you know, some, some examples of, of private sector investments that are really working, where we can sort of learn the lessons and maybe scale up. Yeah, I mean, the fossil fuel story is a story of jobs. So um, ending fossil fuels means lots of jobs are going to disappear, which is why you need a proactive industrial policy to replace them. And it's a failure of planning, a failure of vision and a failure of delivery, um, which is why we have to make the green stuff profitable, right? We've got to just make people to want to put their money into other things. That's how the industry dies. Um, and I think EV, what, a policy that's worked really well has been the banning of um, internal combustion engine vehicles from 2030. So suddenly everybody is interested in electric vehicles. We've still got a problem with um, infrastructure charging. Um, lots of it being built with 100% public grants in areas where we know there's high demand and we need that to be a universal good in the same way the postal service is. But that means investing, investing ahead of um, proven demand. And I'll just tell you a, a good news story. Um, we're hoping to see the launch of uh, EV charging in um, Orkney. So making use uh, of some of the offshore wind that is spilled because it's not connected to the grid. They're building out a whole load of infrastructure. And one of the challenger banks in the UK is going to provide a first of a kind utilisation link loan. Um, to that project. So you pay back based on the amount of revenues um, you make, which are uncertain. So taking on some revenue certainty risk. Um, while we were in the process of trying to get that, that, that deal over the line, the team at the bank said we'd really like, like if some sort of slice of the risk could be taken just to help get this through the credit committee. They were looking for £40,000 on a £200,000 loan. We went to the um, 
Department for Transport, the um, Office of Zero Emission Vehicles, um, who's supposed to be supporting the rollout of uh, EV infrastructure, couldn't provide the capital because they only do grants. We went to the UK Infrastructure Bank. They couldn't provide the capital because the deal was too small. And we went to the British Business Bank and they couldn't provide the capital because they don't do guarantees. So we went to our own funder and asked if we could ring fence £40,000 to put into an escrow as a uh, first loss piece, which they've agreed to. So once that deal closed, we'll be commsing that one to death. That's an example <laughs> of how we need to change how we engage public and private. Thank you. Well, we're, we're at seven o'clock. So, Brett, I'm going to give you, you're lucky enough to have the last word. Um, feel free to come back on, on the other questions as well. But we, we had a question at the front here on the, the role of, of a credit union. Um, and maybe, you know, more generally, you, you could elaborate on your ownership comment there, perhaps. Um, you know, is there a case that part of the solution around financial governance is not just having a bigger state, but also having new types of financial ownership, whether that's cooperative or, or municipal, or, you know, sort of returning to mutuals um, that did play an important, used to play an important role actually in in many high econ uh, high income economies. Yeah, I was sitting here and, and I was thinking, I was thinking, please don't save that question about credit unions for me because I haven't got a clue what the answer to that will be. And lo and behold, that's what you did. Um, I mean, I'm not even going to try and answer that specific question, not because I think it's unimportant, but because I just do not know enough. In fact, I don't know anything about the credit union business. So it would be ridiculous for me to try to um, to say anything specifically there. But to, hopefully, Josh, you kind of widened out that question. I mean, my view on the ownership question is that um, is, is that it isn't a black and white question. So so. Uh, and, and this applies to energy infrastructures, but not just any inf energy infrastructures. It's a it's a view that I that I have more broadly, which is that the solution or the the the, the best outcome is is not what the UK has currently, which is this kind of position where the default model is always private ownership <clears throat> of whatever the asset is, but nor really is the solution public ownership of every of, of everything either. I think, you know, it, it becomes very, very easy to do a dangerous thing, which is to kind of romanticize public ownership as if as if the kind of public ownership of the UK's infrastructures that pertained prior to the 1980s was some sort of panacea where, you know, British Rail functioned perfectly and the electricity, central electricity generating board was a was an ide idyllic institution. You know, none of that is true. Public ownership can be just as problematic in, in different ways, admittedly to private ownership. And it would be ridiculous to assume that just by changing ownership, you necessarily get better outcomes. But so what I would say is two things. One is that at least with public ownership, you have the possibility of a different set of outcomes than you do with private ownership, if not the, if not the um, inevitability of different outcomes. The second thing to, to say is that I think that um, a, a more, a more a potentially, potentially a more useful way of thinking about it is, is in terms of kind of, a as you alluded to, I think, kind of mixed ecology of ownerships, which is that you can end up with some assets being privately owned. Sure, wh why not? But there are some assets that I think should be owned by central government. You know, the electricity grid is a, is a classic example of that, um, the transmission grid. But there are also, for sure, certain types of assets that would potentially prosper better under community ownership or cooperative ownership. Um, you know, whether that's local electricity distribution systems or local wind production facilities or whatever else it might be. So I think a mixed ecology of ownership is the other thing. Just one last word before I hand back. Just to add to what Ingrid mentioned on the question of, foss of fossil fuel subsidies, which is obviously a very, very important question. Uh, and Ingrid is, is, of course, right that a lot of it comes down to jobs. A lot of it also comes down to geopolitics, um, you know, wanting energy security um, in, in one way or another. I think just a, a couple of other things I'd add to that. So, so one is to say that I think it's important so that the question went that the question was articulated as why do fossil fuel company sub subsidies still persist? 
I think it's important to recognize that most subsidies to, to the fossil fuel economy are on the consumption side, not on the production side. Certainly that's true in the UK, so, so which is very, very different from the renewable side. So most of the subsidies are to consumption, not to production. Although, of course, they're an indirect subsidy to production, ultimately. I think the second thing to realize is that, you know, the, the costs of fossil fuel production of exploration and extraction are so massively different in different regions of the world. You know, it costs less than five dollars to extract a barrel of oil in Saudi Arabia, whereas it costs on average about eighty dollars or something to extract a barrel of oil from the from the new fields within the North Sea that are extracted. And without some form of subsidies, that would make um, extraction and production in in parts of the world like the North Sea completely unproductive. And then, last but not least, a lot of the subsidies that do now exist are actually for decommissioning of fossil of fossil fuel architectures. Um, and so. Um, in a way, those subsidies are actually very, very important. So I think the, the subsidy picture on the fossil fuel side is very, very complicated and very, very complex, just as it is on the renewable side of the equation. Brilliant. Thanks so much for, for wrapping up, wrapping us up there, Brett. And thank you uh, to the other two panellists, to Anne and Ingrid, for a fascinating discussion. And thank you to the audience for your, for your great questions. Um, I'll just remind everyone that our next uh, uh, event in this series is uh, Mariana will be um, chairing a panel uh, on the topic of the entrepreneurial state 2.0, rethinking the state in the 21st century. That's on the 6th of June. So do join us there if you can make it. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>